Well, a very good morning to you all, our uh, YouTube listeners and our uh, virtual friends. Uh, welcome to the uh, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust Annual General Meeting 2020. Uh, we're looking forward to interacting with you today. We've got a, a nice program that will go till 12, uh, including a really nice special speaker. Um, so uh, we decided to go this way because of this dreaded coronavirus outbreak um, uh, and we're in this second surge and we've tried to at Yorkshire Wildlife Trust to keep people safe uh, but still nature open because we know how beneficial that is for all. Um, so um, the format today, um, let's have a little look at today's agenda. Um, so welcome to our AGM. My name is Mike Cook. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees. We have 12 trustees and I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, and uh, we're going to go into an annual review of the highlights of uh, what happened in 2019-20. That does seem quite a long time ago. Um, but it was a great year for Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and, and uh, uh, Rachel will go into that, but also tell you how we're dealing with uh, the current situation, but also look ahead at the big themes and the ambitions we have for the future for wildlife, wilder Yorkshire, and engaging you in that wonderful, uh, iconic work. Um, we're then going to move on to the annual accounts, um, uh, which uh, highlights will be brought together for from Pete Batchelor, who's uh, waiting in the wings to uh, go through his stuff. We had a good year and he'll show you what we did with the money, what income we had and how we spent it and how, what good financial shape we've got ourselves into um, to withstand what's been a very difficult time for charities and everybody uh, over the last six to seven months. Um, I'm then going to do a bit of formal business, but I won't take long on that. But we have some formal business to do uh, as an AGM. And thank you for 275 people who've actually filled in all the forms, etc., and sent them to us. So we've got some good feedback there. I think we're expecting 175 actually at this virtual event. So that's great. And thank you so much for giving us your Saturday morning. And don't forget, there's always Strictly Come Dancing later on, or perhaps a bit of rugby versus Ireland, England versus Ireland. Uh, so it's a busy day for all. Um, and many of you want to get outside and, and breathe in that lovely fresh air that we, we have. Um, so let me just introduce, uh, sorry, I'll just finish off the agenda. Um, I, I then, once I've done that, I'm going to hand to Joe Webb, who's the vice chair, who's going to take you through a members question and answer session. We have some really good questions. Uh, there's then going to be an introduction to Dr. Amir Khan, who is a GP in Bradford, who has a really special interest in linking nature with health uh, and he's going to speak to you and then I'm going to do a question answer session with him and then finally some closing remarks from Rachel Vice, our chief executive and we should close about 5 to 12. Uh, so let, let me just introduce a few of my colleagues who are of my fellow trustees. Here we go, that's a rogues gallery and a half isn't it? Um, but we are the trustees and our job is to make sure that we, ha we actually uh, stick to the purpose of this charity uh, about rewilding Yorkshire uh, and uh, our part of the North Sea and the catchments. So um, on the top row, you have myself, Joe, who you'll meet in a minute, Christine Packer, who's our Deputy Secretary, Martin Randall, who's our Honorary Treasurer, Richard Tripp, who is our Honorary Secretary, Professor Alistair Fitter, who's a trustee, David Council, who's a, a trustee, ex-chair, uh, Gerda Singh, who's a trustee, Hugh Williamson, who's ex-on treasury and a, a trustee, Joanna Royal, um, who's a trustee, Lou Farnell, who's a trustee, and Paddy, Paddy Hall. So a really bright bunch of people who are very interested in making sure we remain ambitious for wildlife right across Yorkshire. And we also have a, a really good senior leadership team. There's been one or two changes with notably Rachel coming in as, as a new chief exec, been here a year now and really getting into stride. We're really looking forward to uh, 
working with her over the next period. Uh, Amanda Spivak, who's the Director of Fundraising Engagement. Lisa Kerslake, who joined as Interim Director of Operations for South and West. Pete Batchelor, who is our Director of Finance and Central Services, you'll hear from him later. Uh, Terry Smithson, who is the Director of Ops for uh, the North and East. And Tracy Davidson Frank, who actually is our people person and runs our human resources and training setup. So those are the people who run Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, and I thought you'd like to see them, even though it's virtual. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, there are uh, minutes, uh, there'll be apologies, um, but like what I'd like to do is to just um, give thanks to all of those individuals who do a great job. Um, so um, in terms of uh, today's action, there is a Q&A box. We have got uh, pre-determined questions that people have sent in. We're going to be taking a few of those, but if you have some really pertinent stuff, please um, send them in uh, and if we can't answer them all we'll, we'll make sure uh, we answer them uh, in, in due course. So uh, my job now is to introduce our Chief Executive Rachel Bice um, who joined us last September uh, from Cornwall to Yorkshire, two iconic counties. Higher authorities tell me that Yorkshire is probably the best one. Um, Pleasure to introduce you to bring alive both last year, 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, um, how we're getting through this current situation and what are our plans moving forward uh, in creating an ever wilder Yorkshire uh, uh, in an even more iconic uh, county um, uh, to engage you all. So it's great pleasure to introduce Rachel Bice. Unmute. There we go. Thank you, Mike. Much appreciated. Um, and good morning. I should, hopefully people can hear me now. If someone can give me a thumbs up. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for joining us online today. Um, we appreciate this is a really unusual time um, for the trust. And thank you for the navigating the technology to join us, although I'm sure you're getting quite used to it now. I'd like to thank our staff who've put, worked really hard to put this event on today. Um, it's been a different sort of challenge in, in 2020. Um, and this is now my second year in the privileged position of being the CEO of Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. Um, I've been getting out to see some of Yorkshire, but as you could imagine, because of the two lockdowns, not as much as I might have hoped. Um, and on the subject of the pandemic, um, I'd like to pay tribute to our staff, volunteers, members and supporters who've helped us to remain active through the two lockdowns so far. Um, we've learned a huge amount in the process. There have been challenges and each time I've been delighted to see the willingness of our YWT family to keep each other safe and our work going wherever has been possible. So this morning, um, I'm going to be talking to you about our um, successes in 1920, um, which seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? When our freedoms were, were very much unbounded, um, uh, those halcyon days. <laughs> and this year this year has been tough. But what I think is really important to do is also to look forward. So I'm hoping to inspire you to stay involved with our work and um, as we seek to do more um, for Yorkshire's nature together. So why is our work so important and the support that you give to it so vital? So our common species are still declining. Um, it's estimated in the State of Nature report last year, between 13 and 15% of England species are threatened with extinction. 69% of species overall are either in a static or declining state. Only half of the UK's fisheries are being sustainably fished. And about 60% of our triple SIs are in unfavourable condition across the UK. It's bleak if you look in that direction, and I don't hide from that. However, from the small acts of feeding the birds, leaving the grass and hedges to grow, keeping messy, wet and dark areas around our homes, 
all the way through to the large restoration projects which reforest industrialized landscapes restore our uplands and riverbanks or the creation of new wetland wetlands and quarried spaces um, my goodness wildlife lets us know when we're getting it right so there is an urgency with which we um, undertake our work that's really relevant to the, our times. So the more we can do, the slower these declines will become. And one day, I hope that we'll return to growth and we're playing our part in try to enable that. At the Trust, like so many others, in 2019-20, our trustees declared our acknowledgement of the predicament that we're in with regard to the climate and ecological emergencies. And we made a commitment um, to play our part to mitigate climate change by becoming at least carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and we're in the process now of assessing our carbon footprint, um, working on um, what we think our land holding sequester and what the balance of that's going to be and how, that we, how we can um, play our part. Secondly, to address the, both the, the ecological emergency alongside the need to adapt to the climate emergency, because some of the changes are now baked in, um, we'll be seeking to play a leading role to catalyze the delivery of Yorkshire's nature recovery network as part of an alliance for nature, so that not only are we trying to reverse the declines, we're also trying to help wildlife um, survive and thrive through the changes that we're all going to live through. So how do we work? Um, as you know, supporting wildlife is our core business and our work on living landscapes and living seas has been seeking over many years to restore and grow the wild places across Yorkshire so that our resident and migratory wildlife has a place to rest, feed and breed every year in perpetuity. Um, and the wonders of that can be seen in our reserves, if, particularly when you know where to look. And sometimes they put on those marvellous displays that we might see at Potterick or at Spurn um, when there are, there's more wildlife than you can actually take in. Um, and what a wonderful sense of awe and um, excitement that is. We also work with you, our members, volunteers, stakeholders, staff, to show that nature matters to Yorkshire's residents and thus seeking to generate the awareness of the importance of a wilder future and how by working together, we can create a wilder Yorkshire for everybody's benefit. And this is important because in the past year, um, we've seen how hard it is to protect our precious places for nature. So you, I'm sure you will all be aware of the high profile campaign to save Askham Bog um, and the many species that it hosts, including the royal fern that you can see in the corner of this slide. The effort made to prevent that damaging development next door to the bog was huge, drawing in many supporters to Askham to generate the awareness of the importance of um, its importance. And um, so many of whom then became um, generous, donate, provided generous donations to enable us to take part in the planning inquiry, which was now, amazingly, a year ago, um, how time has, has flown in this unusual year. That planning inquiry um, brought together a, an amazing team. We're so grateful to our president, Sir John Lawton, our trustee, Professor Alistair Fitter, a hydrology expert, Alex Jones, combined with legal support from the Environmental Law Foundation, Emma and Dara, who did a remarkable job for us um, to put together a defense that we were delighted to hear earlier this year, not in 1920, but in 2021, that that campaign was a success. We were so, so humbled by the support that we received um, and the work that was put in it was it was remarkable and we're now working to work, understand how we can secure the bulk for the future alongside these successes there are times where um, our efforts don't um, uh, work out in the way that we we want them to and I thought um, it would be useful to say that while some that we win there are losses and we were very disappointed this year that our efforts to protect willow tip habitat at Walkden Foot a reserve down near the Peak District was not powerful enough and sadly a series of territories will be lost to a scheme to underground power cables. We always want to do more but our experience at Askham shows 
how much support we need to garner to protect nature when it needs it. And so thank you to everyone um, of you who will have helped us signing petitions and donatings. When we win, they're our wins. Um, and we'll keep doing our best to minimise the losses. Um, and your help will always make a difference to how much we can do on that. So really important. And um, thank you very much for, for the um, support you've shown for us and the wildlife on these matters. I've just ooh, rolled on. Uh, there we go. Extra slide. So alongside that jeopardy, which is real, and we, we know that and we see it each, each day around us, there are also there's tremendous cause for hope as well. And restoration is possible given the time. So while we know um, there are points of success and of disappointment, this hope keeps us going. And at Potterick Carr, after decades of careful restoration, um, we're delighted that it now boasts the wonderful bittern, the bearded tit and the marsh harrier as residents. Potterick's a collaborative success with the community of volunteers um, and supporters over many years, and we hope that it will continue to attract visitors. And we're wondering now how many more species might make it their home. Um, it's a it's a fantastic visit if you if you haven't been recently so and we've managed to keep it open during lockdown so it's still there for you if you if you need it. And Potterick shows us the importance of the patience in the restoration game. Um, if we keep uh, creating the right conditions, the wildlife will come and um, our adoption of Ripon City wetlands that came into the trust management during 1920 to continue its restoration journey. Um, it shows our hope that that will also support a wide range of species into the future. It's tucked next to the race course, just on the outskirts of the town and well worth a visit if you're passing. Restoring qu quarried spaces might seem challenging enough, um, which is an example of Potterick and Ripon. However, there's another um, which ups the ante further in terms of the skill and challenge, which is the restoration of our upland peat which needs vision and expertise. And I'm proud to say our team has that in spades. And the skills and commitment to work in partnership to resource the work in an extreme environment. The Yorkshire Peat team, our partnership team are in demand. Um, and we can't thank you enough for being part of the Give Peter Chance campaign that we ran last year that raised more than £80,000, which is enabling the team to do more on the ground and importantly, to be able to share their expertise with um, people like DEFRA, the IUCN, um, to, and to be one of the driving forces in the emerging idea around the Great North Bog. So we hope that our work can catalyse the release of much great, greater funds from government um, to invest in peatlands and to prevent carbon emissions and restore this wild, valuable wildlife habitat too. And from these upland sources, down our varied rivers, all the way to the sea, YWT is making a difference. Um, we're working to ensure that we understand the species who are both resident and migrating through the North Sea, as only then can we make people aware of the myriad of species around our coastline and ensure that they can live safe and healthy lives. And that's a particular challenge in this incredibly busy, maritime, economically active area of the, of the North Sea. So making sure we have the capacity and the evidence at our fingertips to have the right conversations at the right times, we can have significant influence on making sure that development is not damaging to wildlife. And sometimes we have to draw lines in the sand where that's too much and make our voice heard. And to do that, we're working with other wildlife trusts to develop a, North, a strategy for the English North Sea so that we can give wildlife a clearer voice as development pressure increases. We also are doing work on um, restoration. The oyster reintroduction continues. There are plans for propagating seagrass for re-establishment around Spurn and a new production method for scallops too. The team are hugely inventive and the support that they receive is always really greatly appreciated. Getting out by the sea is a great way to inspire people. I'm sure we all know that, but we haven't been able to do so much of it this year, have we? Um, to see just what's beneath the surface of the water and the awe and wonder in that. Um, the other thing that um, uh, work around our coastline does, it allows people to get involved very easily to show that they care and contribute to the massive effort that is needed to clean up the pollution which blights our seas and tidal habitats. So every action makes a difference and our team are continuing to work to engage businesses, communities and individuals to take action. 
And while we can't get out quite so far away, possibly from our doorsteps to um, to see the nature on the coastline, um, getting our dose of nature on our doorstep is also possible. And many of us this year have had to spend time at home. And so knowing where to look, where the wildlife is near to your doorstep is really important. And for example, our work in urban communities such as Bradford, enabled by the National Lottery Community Fund, um, has enabled us to reveal those, um, the wonders of the urban jungles that so many of our communities live within and to help families pay their part in caring for those species. And, um, oh, I just went one too fast. And you'll remember um, back in 2019 when we could um, have these uh, <laughs> amazing spaces where we could bring thousands of people together. We um, created the wildlife zone at Country Fire Live at Castle Howard. And this event was so successful. It's helping us to inform the future engagement work that we're going to be doing um, and to inspire people about wildlife. We're making a big splash when we can. So watch this space for our, um, as we start to think about developing Yorkshire's own team Wilder um, and to deliver some great event, um, engagement events in 2021, when we dearly hope we can mix more freely again. Speaking of our future ambitions, um, as you know, we are part of the Federation of Wildlife Trusts and collectively we've set ourselves a goal of campaigning for 30% of the UK's wildlife land and sea, UK's land and sea, to be positively managed for wildlife by 2030. Um, we currently estimate around 15% of Yorkshire's wildlife is positively managed. So there is a long way to go, but we've also got some great exemplars that we can, we can and other partners can show how this can be done. So we want to get the right partnerships in place with landowners, communities and businesses. And your support, with your support to, behind us, we believe that we can reach this goal. Critical to the delivery of that is through the, the development of the Nature Recovery Network based on the principles of the Lawton Review, um, getting more, bigger, better, and more joined up spaces, generating a net gain for biodiversity. And speaking out for wildlife as an important part of making this happen. So both talking and walking the Nature Recovery Network into being. We're really delighted that due to a very generous gift, from, a legacy gift from the Joyce Merry Mountain Foundation Trust, we've got, now got some additional resources to help our ambitions um, to make nature's voice heard in the corridors of power around Yorkshire. The combination of having staff capacity, your support in numbers um, from our members, et cetera, um, will really help amplify our strategic impact, giving a voice to wildlife now and for future generations to come. And what the Wildlife Trusts overall have a collective ambition to raise £30 million over the next year um, to enable that recovery to be accelerated. And we have our own Wildlife Recovery Fund to allow Yorkshire's um, Wildlife Trust members and supporters to make their donations count against this target. These funds will help um, to support our common species, such as hedgehogs, swifts, frogs, bats, butterflies, the things that we like to see all of the time um, through our advocacy for wildlife and managing our reserves. But it also helps us have the capacity to attract in specialist funding as well, where some species like the water vole, great crested newts, barn owls need more specialist interventions or particular um, investments like those barn owl boxes um, to be put up, which we need to attract money for sometimes. So all of the, the support that you give through that fund, much appreciated and enables our work. So it's my time now to thank you uh, and I can conclude my update to you with a huge thank you for all of the support that we've had this year. Everything I've talked about today is a result of a huge team effort for wildlife of, of which every one of you play an important role. Um, together we make a huge difference so let's keep doing more and thank you very much for listening and happy to answer questions in the Q&A later um, and I'll hand back back to Mike thank you thank you Rachel uh, that was a great introduction to our AGM uh, really good of you to uh, put the preparation in if you can stop sharing your screen and uh, um, we will take, uh, we'll go interactive at 10.40, folks, when uh, 
uh, when we finish the next session. Um, and I'd just like to go straight into that and we'll take any questions that have been uh, uh, raised during Rachel's presentation as part of the overall members Q&A. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel. And um, uh, Peter, Peter uh, is, is our uh, um, Director of Finance and Central Services. He's now going to take you through the year uh, of uh, to 31st of March 2020 uh, with a financial summary and some of the highlights from last year. Over to you, Peter Batchelor. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be able to present to you all this morning. Uh, my name is Peter Batchelor. I'm the uh, Director of Finance and Central Services here at the Trust. Uh, I'm going to take the next 10 to 15 minutes to provide you with an overview of the financial performance of Yorkshire Wildlife Trust during the year to 31st of March 2020. Um, and since then, obviously, a lot has changed in the last six, nine months as well. So I'll also touch on how the Trust has been impacted financially by the uh, global pandemic. So looking at the year to uh, 1920, we're going to look at our income and where our funding comes from, uh, how we spend our funds, and we'll have a look at the Trust's financial reserves position um, at March 2020. So on an income side, the Trust has come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, so we've grown from an organisation with around 3 million of income 10 years ago to one that now is now generating around 9 million pounds of income per annum. Uh, during the year to the 31st of March 2020, the Trust generated income of 8.7 million, slightly down on the previous year, although nonetheless a, a really solid outcome. And to put this into context of the Wildlife Trust movement nationally, total income across the 46 Wildlife Trusts in the year is likely to be around £130 million. So Yorkshire represents around 7 million, of, uh, sorry, 7% of what National Wildlife Trust income uh, will be. Uh, in 1819, we were the largest of the 46 Wildlife Trusts based on a measure of income, where our income was 9.4 million, uh, and we expect this might be repeated in, in 1920 as well. So where did our 8.7 million of income come from? So 4.9 million, so that's 56%, comes from, uh, came from grants and contracts in the year. In fact, in each of the last three years, the Trust secured over half its total funding through contracts or grants for the delivery of conservation and engagement programmes in Yorkshire. The table you can see uh, shows a summary of the major sources of funding, um, many of these funds being directly related to the delivery of some of those specific conservation and engagement activities uh, that we do, uh, with subsequent expenditure effectively following the income. So 3.1 million was secu uh, secured from government sources. So that's both central departments and working with our local authorities. So that was to deliver peatland, rivers, grassland conservation programs, as well as our nature friendly schools program. Just under 400,000 pounds of funding was received from the People's Postcode Lottery and Esme Fairburn Charitable Trust. And this funding helps us to fund our nature reserves, our campaigning and communications and the Living Seas program. And £330,000 was granted to the Trust by the National Lottery Community Fund to support our Bradford Urban Discovery Project, which was mentioned, and our Tomorrow's Natural Leaders, um, both of those environmental youth engagement programmes. The rest of our income comes from our supporters, so that's through membership, legacies and donations, um, as well as our activities such as visitor centre operations and engagement activities. Now, maintaining and growing our income through membership and fundraising is, is fundamental to the trust future, uh, enabling us to continue to deliver, grow and support the core conservation engagement operations. During 1920, we continued to grow our membership uh, with 45,561 members generating 1.3 million in income. The trust was also incredibly grateful to those supporters who, who left us almost one million pounds in legacies in the year. Um, and the, the names of the 16 generous uh, legacy donors are set out in, in note three to the accounts. We also continue to forge closer relationships with our corporate partners. This includes Yorkshire Water, Aggregate Industries and all our corporate members. Um, this is to both generate income, but also help these corporates shape their own approach to the environment and, and wildlife. 
Um, you might have noticed Yorkshire Water's name. It also appeared on the previous slide. In total, we received 0.8 million of funding via Yorkshire Water during the year to March 2020. Uh, this included uh, £300,000 towards their ongoing commitment to peatland restoration and £450,000 to support our conservation work across the River Swale and River Torn catchments, including Nature Reserves, Potterick, Carr and Bolton on Swale Lake. Uh, it's with huge thanks to the generous donations and gifts that we receive from our supporters, including all of you watching online today, that we're able to leverage so much of the restricted funding, the grants and the contracts from funders, in effect turning the 3.8 million here of supporter income into 8.7 million of total income. It's a fantastic effort. So expenditure, um, for anyone attending last year's AGM, this slide is virtually unchanged. Um, in 1819, total expenditure was 8.2 million. And again, in 1920, total expenditure was 8.2 million. All the percentages actually are also virtually unchanged with only small minor increases of no more than 1%, uh, slight increases in our spend on the Living Seas programme, uh, raising to 5% and on the fundraising uh, side of things as well. You will see from the slide, 56% of our expenditure is spent on our living seas, that's our, uh, sorry, our living landscapes, that's our land-based activity. Only 5% on living seas, 19% on nature matters. The imbalance is largely driven by the specific requirements and restrictions of, of much of that uh, funding that we receive through grants and contracts. So let's look a little bit more closely. Our nature reserves. The trust spent 1.25 million pounds managing its nature reserves during 1920. So this was up on the previous year where we spent just about a million. Um, and to fund that 1.25 million, we received about 1 million pounds in income from land subsidies, contract management, various grants and rental incomes um, towards the cost of maintaining and managing our nature reserves. We fund the balance annually through membership income and donations. And most access conservation capital projects of scale on nature reserves, we undertake when we're able to secure specific funding. I've highlighted on the slide a few of these sites where we were able to do this during 1920, thanks to funding from FCC Environmental Landfill Fund, Aggregate Industries, Yorkshire Dales Millennium Trust and Natural England. Uh, combined spending on two of our flagship peatland and rivers programs was almost three million pounds during the year. So the rivers program was active on eight Yorkshire rivers catchments on rivers such as the Wisk, Swale, Derwent and Esk in North Yorkshire, the River Hull and the Humber in East Yorkshire, um, the Air and Calder in West Yorkshire and the Idle Torn, Dern and Don in South Yorkshire. Um, this Rivers programme is undertaking working very closely in partnership with the Environment Agency and a number of the local authorities. The Peatland programme continued at pace with over two million of spend during the year. This was across upland peat in the Yorkshire Dales, Moors and North Pennines, as well as on the lowland peat in the Humberhead levels. Now, it should be noted that in addition to the two million you see going through the accounts, sorry, 2.3 million, uh, we also administer and resource to further 0.8 million of peatland works, which you uh, don't see in the Yorkshire Wildlife Tr uh, Trust accounts. This was working in partnership with the North Pennines AONB and with Natural England via the higher level uh, stewardship scheme. So in 1920, we spent uh, 0.4 million pounds on our Living Seas programme. So this was actually our largest spend on the Living Seas programme in any year since uh, we began this work in 2007. So typical annual spend in the region has been a, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. The last two years, uh, we've been in the 400,000 pound range. Our North Sea Marine Advocacy Programme, campaigning for protection of the oceans, continues to benefit from the support of the Esme Fairburn Charitable Trust. And 1920 also saw us working closely with the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. They funded um, our works, our projects, including marine pollution, fishing for litter, and um, our activities programme at the Living Sea Centre in Flamborough. Now, this funding ended in March 2020 uh, with uh, the exit from the European Union, and we must seek alternative funding sources uh, to continue many of our uh, marine engagement activities. Um, and the Trust is, will be looking towards potentially launching a marine appeal during 2021 to help support this. 
On the Nature Matters side, uh, direct expenditure on our engagement activities totaled one and a half million pounds. Uh, this is again largely unchanged from, unchanged from prior year. I've mentioned a couple of the larger youth engagement programmes earlier, um, but I, I wanted to just mention one of the uh, pro projects where we were able to be a bit more creative in terms of the use of resources um, to maximise engagement. So, uh, you, as you heard, we uh, were at Country Far Live uh, during the summer of 2019, running the Wildlife Zone, a huge undertaking. Now we have very limited resources available at the time to do this. We secured a £10,000 grant of funding to facilitate the setup and costs of attending, and then supplemented this with our amazing staff team and volunteers uh, to engage with uh, thousands of people at this event, running what many have said was one of the best displays and activities at Country Far Live North. Uh, so on the fundraising side, as I mentioned, growing the trust's unrestricted income to resource our activities is essential. Um, and you'll see from the expenditure in note eight in the accounts, we currently spend around £600,000 on individual giving fundraising. Um, the opportunity for the trust to achieve membership growth and increase income through donations and legacies in Yorkshire is considerable. Uh, although to do this is necessary to invest in fundraising and be able to reach to enable us to reach more people, and increase awareness of our cause. And of course, underpinning the trust with efficient and effective systems, processes and central support is essential to enable our members, volunteers and supporters and the general public to experience and enjoy wildlife with us in Yorkshire safely and securely. And we must spend uh, money in these areas, although we do our very best to do this as efficiently as possible. Uh, one other item of note that I will mention, which is good news for the trust in the year, is the trust exited the Wildlife Trust multi-employer pension scheme. Uh, and we actually received a £35,000 refund on this departure. And there's further, in, further information available on the, uh, in note 16 to the accounts. So now let's take a quick look at the trust's financial resources. Uh, which, as we're aware, is essential for the Trust to ensure it remains financially resilient and deliver on its charitable objectives. The Trust has a strong balance sheet uh, with net assets of over £12 million. Now, this is made up of our general unrestricted funds, restricted funds, designated funds and fixed asset funds. And you'll see from the slide that the Trust's uh, financial reserves are largely made up of the fixed assets. That's our land and property. Uh, it's not readily available for use necessarily in terms of the finance unless we were to realise the asset or raise loan funding against it. So at 31st of March, the trust had restricted balances um, of 3 million. That was down slightly on previous year. These funds are restricted for specific purposes to be spent in 2021 or support activities into the future. Again, there's, the detail of this is available in note 20 to the accounts. And as you can see, our general unrestricted financial reserves are 1.27 million. That's up approximately 600,000 pounds on the prior year. Now, general unrestricted financial reserves are the funds that we have available to freely use in accordance with our charitable objectives um, and also represent a key part of the trust's financial safety net, supporting our cash flows and mitigating against risks and financial pressures. We therefore seek to hold sufficient reserves to ensure the trust remains financially robust proportionate to the scale and mix of activities at that point in time. It's a very tricky balance to achieve and one that we review regularly. Now, the fortunate timing for the trust of holding um, unrestricted reserves above our target of £900,000 at March 2020 meant that whilst we've not been immune to the financial impacts of COVID, it has enabled us to remain resilient and make sensible financial decisions uh, to protect the trust for the, the medium to long term. So very finally, just looking ahead to 2021, um, COVID has presented its challenges here at the Trust and the uncertainty of the lockdown during spring meant that we initially furloughed uh, 68 of our staff, so it's just under 50%. However, almost all staff have now returned to work with the introduction of COVID safe working. And we've been able to continue most of our operations even during the second lockdown with only our visitor engagement and customer facing activities such as membership recruitment still impacted. Um, in spite of COVID, we anticipate overall income may increase, which is great, back above 9 million, although all important unrestricted income is unfortunately expected to be lower, with a potential unrestricted deficit in the, in the region of £200,000 for the year. 
So unfortunately, we're not out of the woods yet. And the financial impact of COVID on the trust and the rest of the charity sector is expected to continue for some time. Hopefully, I've given you a good flavour of the trust's financial position. Um, obviously, further information is available within the full annual report and accounts, uh, which is available on the trust website uh, or via the Charity Commission or uh, Companies House. I'll hand back to Mike. Thank you very much indeed, Pete. That was a really good overview of the finance and also what that finance achieves during a, a very busy year for all. If you could unshare your screen, Pete, um, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, just as getting us through now, we're just about on time, but I've got a bit of formal business that I would like to uh, um, just conduct uh, quite briefly, but actually already 275 uh, members have have helped us uh, move move forward by uh, posting various comments in 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 the postal ballots etc. Um, so the next section um, is really, as you can see now, approving the minutes of the AGM, approval of the annual report and accounts, appointment of auditors, and then uh, the election of trustees. Uh, and I'll deal with that quite quickly. And then I'm going to hand to Joe and we're going to go interactive with the uh, question and answers and looking forward to that very much. So the first bit, um, uh, thank you very much indeed for all of those who took the time to vote this year. And actually, uh, it's very important to us that our members contribute in running the organisation. And I'm actually delighted to just say we've got 144 people on Zoom watching us and uh, getting involved and also 46 on YouTube. There you go. Uh, multimedia platform, if ever there was. That's 190 people have just Watch you, Pete and Rachel, uh, bring Yorkshire Wildlife Trust alive. So back to the minutes. We did meet last year on the 3rd of October. Uh, and on their voting forms, our members were asked to vote to support the recommendation by the Board of Trustees to approve the draft minutes of the annual general meeting held on the 3rd of October as a full and correct record. Um, these minutes have been available on the website and are in hard copy on request. Uh, on this matter, our members voted 274, uh, nil against, and there were two abstentions. If I can have the slide back up with that agenda, that would be great. Um, thank you. Um, therefore, can I have a proposer, please, and then a seconder to approve this motion? Yeah. I've got a proposer, I think, in uh, Joe, and a seconder, I think, in Martin. Uh, thank you. Could you note that for the minutes? Thank you, Kathy Egan, who is doing the minutes for us, who does a great job supporting the board and, and, and the human resource uh, area of our trust with Tracy. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, so the second point then is to look at the annual report and accounts uh, for 1920, uh, sorry, 2019-20, um, uh, which uh, Pete has just taken you through. Um, what we're asking for is uh, a vote to support the recommendation by the Board of Trustees to accept the annual report and annual accounts for Yorkshire Wildlife Trust as an accurate record. We've enjoyed some brief highlights just now, but the full documents, again, are made available on the website and were, were, were there since August. And I know several of you have had a good look at those. In this matter, our members voted 273 for, nil against, and there was one abstention. So thank you. Can I therefore please have a proposer again and a seconder to approve this motion? Yeah, I think I've got Martin and... Uh, Joe, thank you very much indeed. Um, please let that be noted for the minutes. Um, the auditors uh, were coming around the bend now. We're nearly finishing on this uh, on this part of the business. Um, but uh, it's really important we have good auditors and uh, members were also asked to vote to support the recommendation by the Board of Trustees uh, to reappoint Safri Champness 
as the trust auditors for 2020 stroke 21. On this matter, our members voted 269 for, three against, and there was one abstention. Thank you. Can I therefore have a proposer? Thank you, Martin. And a seconder. Thank you, Joe, um, to approve this motion. Uh, that's approved and please note that for the minutes. Uh, and finally, in this section, um, our members were asked to vote uh, to support the recommendation by the nominations committee of the Board of Trustees for the re-election of the three, following three trustees for their second term, uh, each for an additional four years. Four more years, as the expression goes, uh, but not for somebody over the water. Um, finally, uh, so the, their biographies have been uh, on, on the uh, website and were published with the magazine this year, as well as the agenda. Um, I'm delighted to say um, that uh, somebody called Professor Mike Cook, CB, um, was proposed by Joe Webb, uh, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees, and seconded by Richard Tripp, our Honorary Company Secretary. Uh, thank you. On this matter, our members voted 271 for, two against, and there was one abstention. Uh, secondly, Professor Alistair Fitter, CBE. This re-election was originally proposed by Richard Tripp, Honorary Secretary, uh, and seconded by Sir John Lawton, our President of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, who we're very proud of. Uh, on this matter, our members voted 272 for, two against, and there's one abstention. Uh, and finally, for Mr. Martin Randall, this re-election was originally proposed by Richard Tripp, Honorary Company Secretary, and seconded by myself as Chair of the Board of Trustees. And on this matter, our, matters, uh, our members voted 271 for, one against, and there was one abstention. Uh, these three reappointments have therefore been approved by that process so thank you for participating in that um, and that that uh, gives us strength to the board um, and uh, I'm delighted to say when we went out to, for some further um, uh, recruitment we uh, uh, have attracted three new uh, trustees who we intend to co-opt and I know Joe Webb and colleagues are really looking forward to helping them settle in and again strengthen the board and avoid this problem where trustees terms of office finish quite uh, together uh, and, and create what can be a cliff edge we've managed to succession plan our way through that thank you to everybody for that support so thank you again for each of those votes um, the trust is very strong uh, because of your continued input and support. Um, and now it's my great pleasure, uh, doing, having conducted that formal part of the business, to hand over to Joe Webb, our Vice Chair. Um, uh, over to you, Joe. Thank you for agreeing to facilitate the members' question and answer session. Um, hello, everybody. Um, great to be with you all here today in this strange cyber world that we're in. Um, it's still really moving, actually, to know that there's so many people that are interested and that have come along and, and that care about um, nature and care about the Wildlife Trust's work. We've already got a number of great questions that have come in on the Q&A, um, and we had some that were sent in <clears throat> in advance. Um, there is a facility uh, for those of you that are looking at the questions. It's down at the bottom of the screen. You can see it says something like Q&A in 10, and if you click on that, you can see what questions have come in. Um, if you particularly like any of them and you're keen for them to be answered, um, if you click on the thumbs up sign, that promotes them in the, in the order. And there are some really great ones. So your help in deciding which ones we, we deal with here would be, would be really helpful. Um, so I'm gonna um, start with um, a couple that got um, early thumbs ups. So one, one for... Um, um, Rachel in the first instance um, about Mike mentioning the words about rewilding Yorkshire um, in his talking about the role of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust um, and uh, Rachel you obviously talked about a wilder Yorkshire um, in your really helpful introduction so perhaps you could say a few words about our developing thinking I think about about rewilding um, is that okay? 
Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Thank you. And um, if you could let me know, I noticed in the chat that somebody said that I might have been a little quiet earlier. So I hope I, I'm uh, audible enough. So let me know if I'm not. Um, yeah, re rewilding. Gosh, what a um, exciting and also uh, prov it's a real provocation, isn't it, in some quarters, that term now. So I think Yorkshire Wildlife Trust's position on this is that rewilding in the right place is a very exciting prospect, but that doesn't mean everywhere. Um, and we have the skills and expertise, I'm delighted to say, across the team that can sensitively look at the um, land or the area of coast in question, work with carefully work in partnership either with a landowner or a local community to identify what is the appropriate way in that space to enable wildlife to flourish more. Now in some cases that may well be large-scale rewilding ambitions when that is collectively wanted. In other cases it's more um, subtle than that. So I think rewilding definitely has a place and I've been really pleased that the debate around rewilding has asked us caused us to ask ourselves questions about how much we do, how much we intervene, are our methods most effective, etc. Um, and I think it's an important uh, new addition to the toolbox um, in environmental restoration and growth for the future. Um, but it isn't a panacea. Hopefully that's... That, thanks, Rachel. I think that was better on volume. So that that's super. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go next, not with um, the one that's immediately next, but we will come to it. They're jumping around in the order here. Um, but to one for Pete, because um, I think people were interested to hear about the money we got back from that pension scheme. But clearly some of our members are keen to know that the staff have still got a good pension scheme that they're part of. So perhaps you could um, answer that question. I can. Um, it's a very interesting case of this is a defined benefit pension scheme that the trust was a member of up until uh, 2002. So nobody, uh, there are no current members um, and there was uh, the trust only had a couple of members in that scheme. And um, due to a, a technicality of uh, the trust should have actually exited the scheme um, uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, but it didn't, and that is what has resulted in us receiving a refund. Uh, ha happy to go into more detail if anyone wants to know more, because it doesn't happen very often. Okay, but the, the, the key today, is that there is, a, there is a, a proper pension scheme for our, our staff members. All, all staff at the Trust are uh, um, still within a, an excellent pension scheme, and um, that yeah, we, we pay, um, we look to be as generous as possible into that, uh, both employee, contributions and employer that that's great Thank, thanks very much um actually the next one is another one for you um pete um you were talking about the marine project funding being affected by the changes in europe um and it, it may be something that rachel wants to come into as well but perhaps if we start with you because i think this is sort of about some of the financial implications um do you want to talk a little bit about that and then rachel you sort of need to signal if you want to come into or we'll just leave it with pete Yes, so um, as the question, it's absolutely right. Uh, leaving Europe has meant that there will be no further funding schemes for the marine programme through through Europe. So there are still a few legacy schemes coming through Europe, but most of them, the marine one will have ended. Um, the government are looking at, uh, instead of it being the European Marine Maritime Fund, the marine management organisation are looking at potentially putting in a UK one but the problem with it is the timing and the delay of that being up and ready for it to be able to fund our activities is likely to leave us with a gap in uh, before we can start applying to that new fund. Um, we are looking at lots of other funding streams, the Green Recovery Fund potentially, uh, and um, talking to some of our partners. But it's where an area where we could really do with more support in the, in the short term to help fill that gap and keep a great programme going. Thank you. Are you okay with that, Rachel? Or do you want to come in with anything else? I'm, I'm very much okay with what, what Pete said. I think just to add, I think Brexit still um, uh, leaves some uncertainty for um, both us as a, in a 
environmental sector sense in terms of the regulations that are, are coming through. I think the, envi the Environment Bill and the Agricultural Act, I think, has now been ascended. So that's starting to make, make the changes that we were expecting. Um, but I think the um, some of the time scales around the payments, particularly for farmers, um, leave an uncertainty um, for them that, that will have a knock on effect for our work as well. So I think, um, yeah, there's still a lot for us to keep an eye on there and um, endeavour to make sure that we have our voice heard. And I'm glad to say the partnership we have with um, RSWT, so the, the central charity for the Wildlife Trust, they're doing a really great job on our behalf to, to lobby for the right things for wildlife. So it's, it's good to be a part of the Federation for, for that reason. Yeah, that's a helpful point to make. Thank you, Rachel. Um, the next question that's at the top of the list is about um, pine martin reintroduction. Um, there was a uh, thought, thought that something had been spotted. One of them had been spotted in North York Moors uh, Park recently. Um, I think I saw that piece in the paper too. So this is an interesting question. Um, so I don't know if, if, if Rachel, you have anything to say on this. I think it's probably something we are thinking about um, alongside beavers. I know we've talked about in the past at the board. So maybe you could say a little bit about this. Mm. So um, that specific story, I'm, I'm not very familiar with, but I know our Norse team um, would probably have their finger on that pulse, as would, and I know our, our director has previously been involved in Pine Martin reintroduction, so I'm sure he's potentially listening to this going, yes, I'd love to do that. Um, so I think there's a broader question around reintroductions overall, um, that we, I, I'm hoping in the, the next year we will start a, a a debate really around what are the reintroductions that we would like to see in Yorkshire overall. There's there's great stories happening around the country, white-tailed eagles, beavers, European bison, um, <laughs> you know, pine martins, red squirrels, all, all sorts. It's, it's an exciting time. All of it obviously takes um, careful funding and licensing, um, but we, we're looking for where could the first Yorkshire Wildlife Trust beavers be? Um, that would be, that would be nice. Um, and, and these other possibilities. So I think a live conversation and if members have got um, ideas about that or expertise that they, <laughs> they um, feel that they could uh, offer to those, those spaces or even space possibly, um, then we'd be delighted to hear from them and we would look forward to that live conversation in the coming year. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is gonna be a ex really exciting area for, for all of us. Um, there's a couple of questions um, that are high up on the list that relate to West Yorkshire, actually. So it might be as well to answer both of those at the same time, um, Rachel. Um, the first one um, is about the rewilding of programme at, at Sturley or the work that we're doing at Sturley, Pro Sturley Farm. And there was a question sent in about Sturley too, um, about what our plans were for there, because there's been work in progress over a period of time. And I think people would be interested to hear our latest thinking. Um, and the other question that I think goes alongside that, um, though they may be meaning further west, <laughs> um, is have we any ambitions to increase our work on the western side of, of West York? So I'm guessing up into the uh, Calder Valley, perhaps like um, up Todmorden Way or um, up more towards sort of Marsden, um, if we're thinking about um, Kirklees. So um, there may be other people, other, other areas as well, but any thoughts we have in terms of more work in that area? So I think I mean West West <laughs> Yorkshire is such a big territory, isn't it? And um, yeah, you forgive me that sometimes when you start saying about places, I'm thinking, how well do I know my Yorkshire geography yet? But I, I'm I'm with you pretty much. Um, I, I, over in the West, yes, I mean we've got ambitions to do more work everywhere. Let's be honest, <laughs> we'd love to, we'd love to be everywhere, but that our reach is um, directly rel. Um, linked to our capacity so we do have the west team who are reaching into I think most areas of West Yorkshire actually so I know we've got work in Calder and Kirklees around Leeds um, further up around on the west um, doing so and we've got work in the uplands with the peat team we've got work going on down through the air valley um, and those other river catchments as well so uh, our invasive species team working a lot in that area too um, so there's there's there is a lot um, happening in that area already. Yes, definitely would like to do more. Um, I think it's the 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 partnerships, the capacities, the funding that that needs to go with that that unlocks it. So um, ideas again, very very welcome, and we'll we'll work in what we can to the work program. Um, 
on Sturley, uh, yeah, we've had an ongoing conversation there around how to uh, most suitably manage the land. And I'm pleased to say the team have worked on a countryside stewardship application and we're waiting for an answer from Natural England on that that will allow us to start to um, make some of the, cha- the, the subtle changes um, the managing that land to, more, to be less farmed and more for wildlife, if you like. So our emphasis shifting from it being a farmed space more to being a wildlife space for community engagement, community inspiration, um, and importantly, fitting in with what the wider ambitions for the landscape that the council holds, so Kirklees Council own a lot of um, Castle Hill and around there. So um, yeah, we're, 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 we're in dialogue with them. We've got um, hopefully some resources supported from Natural England coming our way to help start making those changes. And yeah, there'll be, there'll be more to do and we'll keep you updated on that. That's great, thank you. I mean, just to sort of note for everybody that partly because of the format of this, we haven't got available everybody that we would normally have to answer questions. Um, so that uh, Rachel and, and Pete are going to be getting a lot of the work to be done here. There may be some questions that are answered at the end of this session anyway, or other ones that we might want to add to. Um, and I think we've probably got uh, the ability to put those up on the AGM um, page on the website. Um, so so we, will, we can add to some of the, the, the responses that are being given um, in that way. Um, Another question, the next one at the top of the line, I'm not sure which the two of you want to answer this because it's, uh, why do you not do life membership? Um, That's an interesting question. I didn't know that there was a sort of demand for it particularly, but it seems that it's something certainly that members here have been interested in. Um, Do either of you want, have you got a preference? One of you put your hand up. I would say sure. Pete. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say it would, Pete. Pete may have had this conversation at the trust over the years yeah. he's been here, so I'm wondering if he might yeah. answer that. Yeah, no, it's it's a really good question. Um, we don't currently have one, and uh, we haven't currently got a plan to do it. But we we can take that away and discuss it with the team. Um, I think the things to keep in mind around a life membership is um, ultimately it's it, it's to do with the changing value of money over time and the importance of recurring income. So for us, recurring income is essential because ultimately we need to be able to fund our activities ongoing. Now, a life membership can come in and be allocated over a period, but what you find is as the value of money changes over time with inflation um, that actually the value of that initial donation can, is, is eroded heavily and I'll, I'll give an example here actually my parents joined the National Trust about I think probably 40 odd years ago and uh, their life membership cost them 30 pounds and so <laughs> yeah um, and obviously that that value they, they almost become a liability over a period of time so um, it's it's a really interesting question. I think we, you know, we'll take it to the team uh, who can look at it but uh, I think um, there is I say that recurring income for the trust is, is key. You're saying it would be very expensive apart from anything Actually. else. By that with the example um, that you just quoted of your parents. Okay, th- thanks for that, Pete. That helps people to understand and think a bit about the complexities of it. Um, okay, oh, that, the, the order just changed then. This is, voting makes a difference, people, to, to which questions are getting answered here. Um, this is a, a good one relating to sort of nature recovery networks, the points you were making, um, Rachel, about the sort of law to review and joining things up and how important that is for wildlife because it can't exist in pockets on its own. Um, so there's a question here about, will we be including grass verges in linking corridors? Um, and if so, by what actions? Um, I don't know if you want to, to respond to that, okay? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to say a couple of things around that. So grass verges are an interesting one because I think we would certainly have a view on how they should be managed, um, but actually their management is broadly within the highways departments of um, local authorities or private landowners. So it's around sharing, um, the particular actions are around sharing that knowledge and expertise um, and and also working with other charities on that because people like Plant Life have done it a great job um, in terms of talking about bee lines and um, those pollinator corridors. So working in partnership across the environment sector, I think the different specialisms um, can come through and and we can help um, uh, educate and empower um, those bodies that may not see that wildlife is their core business um, to make sure that their practices are as wildlife friendly as possible. 
So hopefully that answers that question. And I know that there have been various projects over the years, I think, where people have partnered up with um, local authorities, the exact areas I haven't got off the top of my head, but we could certainly put those in the corridor, in the questions afterwards. And I, I was just hearing this week, actually, um, our team in the Lower Derwent Valley have, a, have an ambition to do some more work on this um, in the coming year, funding willing again. Um, so they're, put, they're putting in an emergency bid for, for some Natural England f- funding. So, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, always, always on our minds to, to be able to do that when we can. That, that's, that's great. Thank you, um, Rachel. Um, and I think it speaks very much to that point about when you were talking about getting 30 percent of land managed for nature by 2030. We can't do that on our own. We can seek to increase the number and size of our reserves and we will do that. But we can only really achieve that kind of goal for Yorkshire as a whole by working with other players so it's, it's good good to hear okay there's a there's a good one here from Paul Darcy um I don't know if it's the same person but then we had another one on this from the earlier questions that were sent in advance so that's good um about trying to get better facilities um at Staveley and in particular toilets um and I know that this is a um a, an interesting and difficult area really important to many people for very obvious reasons um but perhaps you could give an answer to that Rachel Yes, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I'm certainly aware that Staveley is a, a popular, very well-loved um, nature reserve and ideally <laughs> would, would have additional facilities at it. Some of the complexity around that is the um, both the capital costs to start doing those things, but then the maintenance, the revenue um, side of that to then keep making sure that those facilities are at the standard that people would expect them to be. Um, and that's one of the challenges. So for example, so currently we do not have the chunk of capital money that would be uh, make that available although you know that's we can apply for grants and things but it's the ongoing uh, ongoing revenue side that becomes the challenge so and that's the case for many of our reserves actually so Staveley wouldn't be alone in being popular and want and and people who are local to it and love going to it saying could we have a little bit more um facilities there please and we're recognizing that about trying to help communicate better what people can expect um, from our different reserves so we've um the team have worked really hard and come up with a um a, a, like a a framework of which the different reserves can um, fit into, which is a wild, wilder and wildest um, spectrum. So uh, those reserves that we've got up in the in the Dales and the North York Moors, they're our wildest. So to some degree, you need to have your backpack, your walking boots and, and to get there and be prepared that there may not be any facilities when you when you get there. And you may need to f- look on a map to find it. Um, the wilder sites are a bit more um, supported in that sense. And then um, the the wild sites, so things like Potterick Car and um, and Spurn, where where there are full visitors facilities. So we've looked, we've assessed the different reserves that we've got. We've categorised them where they are now, and are and a couple of them where we've got aspirations for some more in due course. Um, and we'll be working to try and um, communicate that level of expectation better in future for people so they know what to expect which is really important in terms of accessibility as well um and then and then over time yeah when the resources are available we'll we'll invest what we can thank thank, thank you rachel um i'm gonna join another couple of questions up um there's one that's saying a bit more about preserving and restoring peatlands, which I know is something that you could spend an awful lot of time talking about, but maybe just say a few points about that, um, but also link to it, because again, it speaks to the partnership, mostly we don't own the peatlands, um, is talking about the majority of land in Yorkshire under farm management. In fact, it's just come up to the second one. Um, and can you say something about how we engage with farmers and how this may be something that could be expanded? Okay, so we'll start with, start with the peatlands. Uh, so the peatland work, um, the, the team go through a process of surveying the state of the peatlands first to see um, how they can optimally um, intervene to, to aid the restoration. And actually our team have done some amazing technological work using drones and then algorithms in a system to assess that footage to really 
um, optimize the efficiency with where the grips that are then put in actually make the biggest difference. So they've, they've done some really innovative work on that front. But it is the getting the, the materials up onto the uplands. Um, that's what requires the helicopter. And it's what is, impacts a, a huge amount of the cost. So taking up, you know, rubble um, to make the stone dams, taking up the coir um, logs that then are um, wedged in so that the peak can then flow in and re-establish silt up and re-establish itself. Um, so it's it's um, very hard work in um, hard conditions and often in a difficult season. It's this time of year that the team will be up there. So so think of them when you're you're by your warm fire that the peatland team will be out in the wind of the rain, um, uh, navigating around doing that work. Um, so I hope that that maybe gives a little bit of insight on that. But th there's a fantastic report that was done off the back of the Peatland campaign around the ten the achievements over the 10 years of the Yorkshire Peatland Partnership. So if anybody would be interested to read that, we'd, we'd be very happy to, to share that and they could email in to request that, which gives the detail of how many how many hectares we've um, restored already, how many that more there are to do, the different types of work that we do. So hopefully that, that helps on that one. On farmers, um, I had a conversation um, about this just just yesterday, um, we've got a, um, a series of members of staff who work routinely with farmers across Yorkshire, but in really quite different ways, because the way that the land needs farming in those different areas is quite different. So those teams work with um, with the landowners to identify um, subtly and this is what we were talking about yesterday really important to start from where does the farmer want their farm business to go and and how can our advice support their ambitions for their land and the great thing is if we're allowed to if we're invited onto their space and they want to have a conversation with us is to respect where they're starting from and the possibilities that they have in their business model to be able to include wildlife more so our teams work really hard to um, carefully explore that and give the support that they can um, so hopefully hopefully that answers that question and again we'd be very happy to give more detailed information if that that is what is wanted okay that's good um I'm going to skip over the next one at the top because we've sort of touched on it um but you might you, you can you can comment on that if you want, which is about um, get oh it's gone <laughs> uh, about whether we're still looking to take on more land. And I think that the brief answer is we are in a thoughtful way when it makes sense and the opportunity is there, um, and when it helps contribute to nature recovery networks. Um, but the the next one that's up there is about the great initiative um, to open pottery car to Doncaster's residents free of charge during this period of. Um, of a shutdown, the second shutdown period, because we obviously haven't got all the facilities that we would normally have. Um, they're asking how much has been received in donations as part of that. I, I'm going to look to Pete on this, but I suspect that we won't know yet. Pete? Um, so, I mean, the, fir the first, it's obviously a great initiative because it's, it's an amazing way to get people to remain local during the lockdown. Um, and, a, you know, it's almost to give something back to the local community as well and involve them in nature. Um, in the first week, we've received uh, £209 of donations. Um, obviously, we, um, if people can donate when they visit, that's really important. Most of our sites are free. Um, and therefore, but we do need to pay to manage them and there's a cost to doing so. So we um, would ask everyone to uh, be generous if they are able to go to Pottery Car. Yeah, I guess um, going back to the question about toilets, that's one of the kinds of things that those those funds go to support um, at, at Pottery. Um, uh, OK, um, there's a question here about why the three additional trustees are being co-opted rather than um, elected. Um, and I think um, maybe is Richard on. Do you want to have an answer? Do you want to answer that question, Richard? Richard's maybe here. Yes, go. Uh, volume, Richard. Can't hear you. Mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. Okay. Um, maybe while they're trying to sort out the technicalities of that with Richard, we'll go on to uh we're a bit close on time actually you hear me now oh yeah yes yeah. okay got, sorry we've yes we've got a minute on this richard because i think looking at time we're gonna have to make it the last question yeah sorry i hadn't pushed the right button so uh we ran a very thorough and widely advertised recruitment campaign but unfortunately that 
process wasn't completed in time to enable to get the details circulated for this uh, meeting. So the plan is to co-opt uh, the three successful candidates and they will of course be up for election at the AGM this time next year. So they get co-opted until the next AGM when they have to be formally elected in as trustees going forward. And that's it. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, this has been a really great session. I've really enjoyed it. Um, thank you, everybody who's put in questions. And there's some great ones there that I would like to carry on going. Uh, but we are wanting to keep this tight. Mike, thank you for doing your formal business so quickly that we actually had twice the time we need. We, we advertised for this, but I think it was great to have that time and, and make good use of it. Um, we haven't got the slide up on screen, I think, but there is thank one you. to come up which gives an email address if people want to send it. Uh, their questions to supporter.services at ywt.org.uk um, and I think there are some questions here we'll try and answer on the uh, website as well on the AGM page because um, there's some great ones okay over to you Mike thank, thank you, you Joe uh, Joe Webb a uh, great friend of wildlife across Yorkshire and, and, and wider. So thank you very much indeed. And for uh, <laughs> Pete and, and Rachel <laughs> earning your corn there, well done. Um, okay, I've got a treat for you now. We have uh, someone waiting uh, to uh, give you a, a, a wonderful insight into their take on nature. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Amir Khan, who's an NHS doctor, a GP in Bradford. Um, he's a bit of a media star. He's a, an author. Uh, he's what I call a polymath. He's pretty good at most things. <laughs> but what, what, what I've loved, I, I met him at um, Castle Howard uh, Country Fire Live, and we had a lovely conversation about why we're both very interested in health and well-being and and how green spaces and blue spaces can actually really help people's mental health and as a service user myself with a long history of running uh, some organizations in the nhs i i i know that personally so it's uh, without further ado i'm going to ask amir to talk to us bring it alive for 15 minutes you're very welcome we've got 190 uh, people tuned in to hearing what you've got to say and then we'll do perhaps some q a too over to you amir welcome you're really it's really pleased to have you for for today oh thank you so much mike um that, that was a very generous introduction i really enjoyed meeting you at, at castle howard um so yeah my name's uh, amir khan i'm a gp in inner city bradford uh, I live out in Leeds, so I'm a Yorkshire lad through and through. I grew up in Bradford uh, and, uh, and now I work there as well. Um, so, so I'm really proud to be part of the Wildlife Trust family, really, as an ambassador, but particularly proud to be from Yorkshire and be talking to the team at the, uh, the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. So thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, a little bit about my background, I guess, in terms of where I'm coming at from nature. I'm sorry I haven't got a fancy Wildlife Trust background behind me. I feel really kind of, I feel a bit kind of, I should have, but I, I haven't. So I apologise. That's just a boring grey wall of the TV. Right. So back to business. Um, uh, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, I grew up in, like I say, inner city Bradford. We, I didn't have much access to nature. We grew up in a back to back house. We were a large South Asian family uh, and our front door and our back door really opened out into the street. Uh, and so we didn't have a garden or access to, to green space. And, and I think that is reflective of a lot of people in, in inner city areas, certainly reflective of, of the patients that I serve. I work in, in a part of Bradford called Great Horton, which is uh, very, uh, it is socially deprived in parts. It, it's very multi-ethnic. It's, it's, it's a thriving community. I love working there, uh, but there's very little in the way of green space for the, the, the residents and my, my patients there. Growing up, you know, my, my father uh, had a, a, a really keen interest in nature documentaries and that kind of spilled out over into me. Uh, and then I was one of those kids, like I'm sure we all were, uh, uh, you know, when we went out on bikes and explored. Uh, uh, really green areas and, and very early on I realised that, that that was something I was I was very interested in and then becoming a doctor I was really interested in the health benefits of that and I know lots of people are talking about that now uh, but it's been apparent for for quite some time uh, and and I think for me this is what's going to 
engage the average Joe in nature. You know, we're, we're a breed of people, I think everyone who's listening to this, who are, who's really interested in, in nature and conserving nature for nature's sake. Uh, but uh, the, sadly, the vast majority of humanity is a little bit more selfish than that. And they want to get the benefits of nature for themselves. And if we can show them what the benefit of nature for themselves is, they are far, far more likely to be engaged in, in, uh, in conserving it because it's, it's human nature. What can we get out of it uh, for ourselves? And, and I think this last year has really shown people that, people who may not have otherwise engaged with nature on the level where they think, actually, that is good for me. Um, uh, you know, when, when we have been forced into a lockdown, it's been a really difficult year all around and it's been tragic for a lot of people. But one of the the things to have come out of it, and certainly a survey that was done by Natural England over April and June this year, looked at how people uh, were reflecting on their time with nature during the initial lockdown period. And, and what they found, they, 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 they surveyed adults uh, across the UK. Uh, nine out of 10 adults said that they, um, they, they were, they, they reported that, that they, that protecting the environment was was important to them personally, and nearly three quarters of them uh, were worried about the loss of biodiversity across uh, England, which I thought was really, really interesting. And 40% of the people who were surveyed said they spent more time in nature during the pandemic than they were, were doing before. Uh, what the study also highlighted, which I think is what I'm touching on really, and what is really important to me, uh, is the inequalities of access uh, to nature across the, the country. You know, the, the, the people that didn't have as much access to it and didn't benefit from it as much really are the people from low-income families, uh, low socioeconomic backgrounds, people who didn't work, older people, people from ethnic minorities. So the, it's the, the usual vulnerable groups of people that we see uh, you know, when, when it comes to any kind of inequality, but particularly health inequalities. Uh, and it just doesn't seem fair. You know, we're, we're spending a lot of time conserving areas of nature uh, and green spaces and blue spaces, um, uh, but it's not accessible to everyone. And I can speak from firsthand experience, really, because I, I see these people every single day when I go to work and I go and visit them at home when they can't come and see me. I know the kind of levels of poverty that they they live in. Uh, and I'm really, uh, you know, uh, really proactive when it comes to prescribing green spaces. But even when I'm talking to these families who, you know, struggle to get their kids to school, struggle to put food on the table, uh, you know, really struggling with chronic health problems as a result of poverty or, or chronic pain as a result of psychological issues as well, uh, that go hand in hand often with poverty. Um, it, it's difficult for me to say, well, if you get these two buses and you can, you'll end up in this gorgeous space and it'll be great for you and your family. It just, it just doesn't connect with them. And, and I, I can fully understand that. What we need to do and, and is really make it much more accessible for them, bring it to them. You know, these people who grew up like, who are growing up like I did uh, in these terraced houses back to back, you know, they need to be able to walk out and walk to these spaces. Not, I'm not talking about a park, which is a tarmac area with a few swings and a seesaw, you know, really open green spaces where they can palpably benefit from being there and being mindful in that moment. And, you know, with, with young parents, these are, you know, the, the, the kind of patients that I have often are uh, 17, 18 year olds with, with babies and children, uh, you know, they are not going to be able to get tr public transport to these places. We need to get them out into the area so they can see the benefits of these areas on their children and then on themselves as well. Uh, and it, it will be hard. It's really hard to engage people. It's really hard to engage money, I guess, is the other thing, you know, to, to bring the, the, these places there. But it is so so important if, if you know as a as a healthcare professional one of the things that will have the greatest impact on a community's health is improving poverty in you know in that area and and part of that is linking in with green spaces and and um and nature so we're lucky in that the nhs is um 
10 year long term plan is to, to, to get more social prescribing and that involves more um, green space uh, prescribing and there is so uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there's so many health benefits uh, to being out in green spaces. Bradford in particular um, uh, has uh, one of the highest rates of air pollution in the country. Uh, part of that is how it's situated geographically in that it's it's in a uh, almost like in a valley. And, and so the, the pollution doesn't leave as quickly as it does in other cities, uh, but it's reflective of a lot of inner, inner city areas. Uh, and, and um, you know, the, the rates of asthma in Bradford in children, the rates of asthma related deaths in adults and children in Bradford is, is way, way higher than the national average. And, you know, just planting trees is something so simple that will mop up all that pollution in the, you know, in these inner city areas. But we, we really need to drive it forward as an organization, the Wildlife Trust, as a government as well, but less said about the government, the better for me, I think. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, just simple acts like that. We know about the mental effects, uh, mental health effects COVID has had on the population. I'm speaking to people who are out of work as a result of it. Uh, really, you know, it, you know the, the high, it's, it's been widely talked about how coronavirus and the effects has, you know, it's had a larger effect on, on those people living in lower socioeconomic classes. You know, we've had a chronic lack of investment in the north of England, which has led to this north-south divide in this second wave that we're experiencing now. Uh, and all of that has, uh, you know, is uh, uh, coupled with um, the lack of, I mean, if we look, go back to that survey that Natural England did, th there was far more engagement in green spaces in the southeast of England than there was uh, uh, in the Midlands and up in the north. So, so th th there is real health inequalities, north-south divide. Uh, you know, I don't like to think of it that way, but it, it, unfortunately it is true and we've got to be honest with ourselves. These people um, who, who, who we're lucky because we know the benefits and we have access to these green spaces, but these people who don't, uh, have high rates of type 2 diabetes, worsening cases of Alzheimer's dementia, increased rates of ADHD in their children, uh, poorer pregnancy outcomes. We know that actually just spending time in green spaces or around green areas when you're pregnant actually has better uh, outcomes in pregnancy and childbirth. It's, it's, it's incredible, you know, the, 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 the number of benefits. I can go on and on and on about this, but I think I'll bore you to death, so I, I, I won't. But... The, the, the key thing for me, and I, I know I'm coming at this strictly as a healthcare professional, but I, I really think, you know, uh, as an all rounder, if we show people these are the huge, huge benefits you're going to get from just spending time with nature and encouraging them actually, you know, now you spent time in it. Why don't you try and engage with it a bit more? Why don't you try and conserve it a little bit more? Uh, why don't you try and invest in it a bit more? Uh, that is what's going to uh, uh, change attitudes. And and the evidence is so, so clear, not just from health, but looking at other countries, New Zealand have had a long, long history. I know New Zealand are like, like the, <laughs> on a pedestal for everything, aren't they, at the moment? They're just they're showing us how everything should be done. But, uh, but um, they've got a huge history of green prescribing and their, their mental health is a lot lower as well. You know, you can look at the studies of, of it uh, uh, and... Um, Obesity levels are lower as a, as a result, levels of type 2 diabetes are lower as a, as a result, cardiovascular health outcomes are better over there as well. Uh, and they've really been engaging. I know it's a beautiful country, but so is ours. And we just got to um, get people to, to, to see that. So going back to what NHS, uh, uh, the NHS long term plan, there is some investment, not a huge amount, around four million pounds. Uh, uh, in the NHS long-term plan for social prescribing, for some green prescribing within that. So we have got to, I know COVID, you know, it was taking off before COVID and, and now COVID has kind of put a pause on it. Uh, but, um, but now is the time really, or, you know, once we come out of this pandemic is the real time because people will have engaged with nature during this year. People will know some of the benefits firsthand. So we've got to really capitalise on that once it's once we're out of this pandemic which hopefully with the vaccine won't be too much longer early next year springtime most likely but that is the time to capitalize on these feelings people have and really engage them 
uh, uh, with nature and green spaces. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> That's fantastic, Amir. Real inspiration about nature, well-being, health, but also community engagement and, and, and being using your common sense. I've got yeah. some really good questions. You're, you're firing up the media uh, response as usual. Amir. I know <laughs> you're that type of person. You're very motivating to listen to. Um, Thank you. I'll give you a couple of starter for 10. And um, yeah. a couple uh, from me, actually. What's been your personal favourite wildlife highlight during lockdown? And perhaps can you just give us two or three top tips on well-being to actually try and cope with this second wave? I must say, yeah. I am personally find the second surge is, you know, the sort of second lockdown, I don't know how long, you know, it, 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 it's, it's hard. And any top yeah. tips for us, Amir? Yeah, definitely. So, so my highlights, you know, uh, this year, I, I have I have had some opportunities to work from home uh, uh, as a GP. I've been phoning and video calling patients. Uh, and what I've noticed is, you know, my office overlooks the garden. Uh, and I, it sounds a bit bizarre, but I was noting new types of poo in my garden and I was trying to identify <laughs> which animal was dropping them. So I set up Ooh, an AGM. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I don't Go know on. the rules. I'm new to all of this. It's fine. So, <laughs> um, but it was a badger. And I set up a, a camera and, uh, and, I, and I realized I've got badgers in the garden, which is something I never would have noticed had it not been for the lockdown because uh, I, don't, I don't pay that much attention to poo normally. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the other highlight, I guess, is I'm overwintering hedgehogs at the moment. So I've got two hedgehogs in my utility room who are, uh, one was injured, one has uh, had a lung infection. They're both okay from that point of view, but they're just putting on weight now. Uh, and uh, they are lovely. They do, again, I'll go back to poo. They poo a lot, they wee a lot. They're very smelly, but it is going to be worth it, I hope, in the springtime when they are uh, able to be released again. Uh, so those two are definitely my highlights from uh, from this year. Uh, in terms of tips for this second lockdown, it, it is very, you know, I think it is harder. We, we all know it's harder because it's winter time. We had a lovely kind of early spring uh, time uh, weather wise when it was the first lockdown. This is definitely tougher because a you know, we've got higher rates of coronavirus and probably now we all know someone who's been affected by the virus, whereas in the first wave, we may not have done. Uh, and a lot more people have been personally affected in terms of financially and job wise as well. So and, and, the, and the, this time of year is, is tougher for mental health reasons uh, uh, as a result of things like seasonal affective disorder. What I would say is keep a routine so you know don't if, if you if you've been furloughed or if you you know if you if you're not working for for another reason or if you've got time make sure you wake up at the same time every day do the things you would normally do had you been working so have breakfast if it's time for you to have gone to work but you're not working go outdoors i know the weather isn't fabulous but it's what our mums told us isn't it there's no such thing as the wrong weather just the wrong clothing so you've just got to get out there and, and embrace it. Uh, if you, if you, if you, if that's not possible for you, if you're physically unable to get out of the home, or if you've got responsibilities in the home, like care that you can't uh, uh, engage with the outdoors in that, in that level, uh, actually buying some um, plants, house plants, that kind of thing does have some health and psychological benefits too. So, so I know it's only a small thing, but it's something to, uh, to, to think about. Um, if you're a keen exerciser, I'm a keen runner, uh, exercising outdoors is has far more health benefits psychologically and physically uh, than, than uh, and in green spaces than exercising in urban areas or indoors. So don't be sad if your gym is closed. Go, um, go outdoors. It is far, far uh, uh, better for you as well. And isolation, social isolation is a big issue. So uh, if, if that is affecting you or if it's affecting someone you know, you are able in England to go outdoors with one other person socially distanced and you can go for a lovely walk outdoors, you know, find someone who may well be socially isolated uh, and, and go for a socially distanced walk with them and talk, just talk about how you're feeling. Uh, and, and, you know, they may not have the solution to anything, but talking about it will help. Great advice. Thank you. Real practical yes. stuff there, but yes. with knowledge behind it. So thank yes. you. Uh, you. You're trending well. Uh, we've got uh, Paul Camille and also a couple of others have just 
they, they were listening to something on uh, Country File earlier that described two community purchase schemes of land in the Scotland. And um, they wondered if Bradford might, there might be small areas of open land that can be purchased and made the responsibility of local population decide. Uh, I think that's a yeah. I think that's a great idea. Cool. I've, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I've spoken to our lo local councillor. I don't live in Bradford, so it's difficult. I don't. Uh, yeah. But I do work there, and I do engage with the council yeah. uh, over there. And uh, and and we've we've looked. We've eyed up an area actually in Great Horton, which might be. It's only small, but it it it, it would work well in terms of engaging. The community. What's interesting about the community in, in that part of Bradford? It, it is so diverse. You know, uh, you know, my patient list can consist of of you know white people, South Asian people, Eastern European people, uh, and I can you know I'm lucky enough to be able to speak a number of languages. I can't, I haven't quite mastered Slovakian yet, but I know a few words in it. And uh, and and so when what even though these people have a lot of differences there are so many similarities you know when they come and talk to me the things that we laugh about the things that we get sad about the, you know it's all the same stuff and and you know if we get these people working together rather than living in separate communities uh, they will get the benefit from that integration the social side of things uh, as well as you know if we get that piece of land which we're working towards uh uh engaging nature into that area as well there's so many benefits to be had it's everything is such a slow process though honestly every email takes ages to reply to and all of this kind of stuff it's much much i thought the nhs was slow but Bradford council is slower <laughs> okay thank you for that uh i've got a couple of specifics uh what does dr khan think of nature deficit disorder jonathan platt is asking Dr. Khan thinks it's a real thing and, and it's, it's a, you know, it's a very serious issue. Uh, it's not something that's talked about as much, but I, I think it goes very much, you know, we talk about seasonal um, affective disorder in, in that natural light affects your, your mood. And we know it does because natural light affects things like your sleep cycle, uh, which in turn affects things like your immune system and your mental health. It's the same thing with nature what we know about being outdoors with nature it does affect you inside physically so things like stress hormones cortisol are produced at much lower levels when you're outside uh, things like neurotransmitters in your brain and your nervous system which make you feel better like serotonin and dopamine are produced at much higher levels when we spend time outside so it makes perfect sense that if you're not uh, uh, exposed to nature, you have higher stress hormone levels, lower happy neurotransmitter levels, and so your mood will dip. You'll suffer from higher levels of anxiety, uh, low mood, even depression. Uh, so it's a it's a very very real thing. Mm. It's just um, what we need now are really robust studies to 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 show that it, it exists, and so we can manage it as well. And that's that's where we're at at the moment. Thank you, Amir. Um, there's a bit of a follow up from Paddy Hall, actually, one of our trustees just saying um, these sources of funding for the NHS to do the green prescribing, I think it's called social prescribing now. Mm. Um, could you just say a little bit more about that? And, and when do you think they might be coming? Can we get some, our hands on it between us all? Uh, so I've been I've been speaking to um, Tom Horton and, and Dominic Higgins about this, who are part of the Wildlife Trust family, uh, and they are definitely engaged in this pilots that were set to go on uh, uh, in the south of England. The funding is coming through NHS England, so I can only speak on behalf of England uh, rather than the other um, four nations or the three nations, I should say, really. Uh, but um, uh, they are the funding is already there so it, it comes in in something called primary care networks where gp surgeries are encouraged to work with neighboring practices to put services together that benefit the entire population of that area so part of that is um uh, employing social prescribers which we've done already mm. uh, and then the next step of that so social prescribers will will target people who will who suffer from mild to moderate depression or mental health disorders social isolation financial issues that 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 kind of thing where medication may not be the right thing for them but they do need support uh, uh, or they might need support in conjunction with medication and so so they will target them and then they look at any community projects that might be beneficial to them and that could be green projects it could be exercise programs that are free uh, uh, anything that's on offer really and whether it will benefit them so the, the money is there it's coming through primary care networks and I know 
the Wildlife Trust are really keen to engage with NHS England about it and get involved with the Greens prescribing and open up the land that they have for these activities. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure it's already being done in areas. Great, thank you again. Uh, Lorraine Dowson is just following up this inner city idea. Um, what do you think Yorkshire Wildlife Trust can do to help address some of those problems of access? As a child, she lived in the back street of Industrial South Leeds, and she really knows the benefits of access to green space. But what do you think we could do as a wildlife trust to, to get into well, that? Well, um, more? yeah. I think, you know, if there are any areas in inner city um, uh, places that are being developed, I think the Wildlife Trust, because you have such a wealth of knowledge about, you know, it's not just a case of, of, of getting the land, it's maintaining the land, isn't it? And making it, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, approachable for wildlife and making wildlife get in there, really, because uh, it's not a garden, isn't it? We, we want somewhere that is actually really engaging with nature so people can go there and see things that they may not otherwise see. And that's where the Wildlife Trust expertise come in. If that is difficult, and I know uh, this might be a little bit pie in the sky, but if there is any way to offer some kind of free transport or access to their Wildlife Trust areas from these socially deprived communities, really engage with them, schools, but not just schools, adults as well. You know, we, we, we've got to find a way of getting these people there that doesn't cost an arm and a, and a leg. So, so because it is all about just getting there. That is the major stumbling block for a lot of people. And knowing that it's even there. Uh, and, and, uh, and so whether we can bridge that gap, and I don't have the answers for that really. I think a lot of it comes down to money more than anything else. Uh, uh, um, then uh, then I, would, I, I would say that's, that would help a great deal. Great, thank you, Amir. Uh, just as a, a couple of closing ones, if I may, I think we're coming to uh, our time with you. Thank you so much for it. Um, here's a practical one. I only have a 30 minute lunch break and I'm now working from home. What's the best thing I can do to go outside and make the most of this time for my health and well-being? Okay, so uh, depending on, on what your background is, different activities uh, have different health benefits. Uh, in terms of time, 30 minutes lunch break is perfect because all you need, you know, there's, there's a massive study done a couple of years ago that shows that 120 minutes per week uh, outdoors with nature uh, has been proven to have beneficial health uh, effects. So if you've got 30 minutes a day, I'm terrible at maths, but that will add up to 120 minutes, I'm sure, over the course of the seven days. That's, that sounds about right in my simple mind. So, uh, uh, um, so the... If, you know, just simply being in nature is good and being mindful in nature. I'm, I'm very cautious of prescribing specific activities because I think it complicates things. Mm. Uh, and, and I think just spending time in nature and being mindful and listening to things and, and looking at things, putting your phone away and just being in that moment is really, really important. But certain things help certain people. So, you know, I talked about uh, improving memory. Uh, well, I didn't talk about this, but I talked about uh, people with dementia uh, and uh, uh, Alzheimer's dementia in particular has shown uh, uh, to be uh, better. Those people are shown to be better off when they spend time in nature. But memory in general for young and older people, if you do things like horticultural activities outdoors has been shown to, to improve your memory. But actually just spending time outdoors in natural light, particularly you know, if you've been in your office all day at home, spending time in natural light is so good for something called your circadian rhythm, which just sets your body clock for everything. If you're having a better night's sleep as a result of spending time outdoors uh, with, with, in natural light, and all, you know, we, we know natural light gives you vitamin D as well, which is a hot topic right now, um, but, um, but, but better sleep because of time outdoors. I know it's a bit of a tenuous link, but there is a link. Uh, will improve your immune system, your memory, actually reduce rates of cardiovascular disease. It actually can reduce the risk of solid tumors as well, like bowel cancer and lung cancer. So, you know, they, they, there are some real health benefits from just being outdoors, just being outdoors, that is it. So if you've got 30 minutes for lunch, grab your sandwich and just go outdoors, wherever it is, it will help. Good answer, thank you. Uh, and a final one from uh, us. Uh, this one ends, it's so cold and dark in the winter. <laughs> but how can I improve my health and well-being using nature this winter? Just finish right. on that and maybe a finishing comment as well. Okay, we, we are looking in that we've actually had quite a mild autumn so far. So it's not that cold. Uh, it is dark. We can't do anything about that. 
but you have got a window of opportunity, haven't you, in the daytime? And part of it is changing the way we think about this time of year. You know, I don't have a solution to the cold and the dark, but, you know, we, you can definitely think of it in a different way. You know, th this year, because of the amount of sunlight we had and, and the rain, we had a beautiful autumn where and the leaves were such stunning colours. Mm. Uh, uh, and 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 I, I think that me personally, I noticed that more than ever this year. But you've got to really be able to to look for it. You've just got to put on your big coat. I know I sound like a mom now, but you've got to put on your big coat and your wellies, and you've just got to get out there. They, if you sit at home making excuses, it will become dark because you'll have missed the daylight. So you've just got to get out there and and do it. And in terms of your your, your health benefits, there I've listed them over and over and over again. Just spend twenty minutes a day outside. Uh, and, and then you can come in and have a really lovely hot chocolate and feel really proud of yourself because you've got it out of the way, you've done it. And the more you do it, you'll enjoy it and it won't feel like a chore anymore. Great stuff. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say thank you. And then I'd perhaps you just leave us with one final thought. It's been lovely interacting with you again. And thank you for giving us your time. We're really proud to have you as a national ambassador for the Wildlife Trust movement. And we can all see why you are. Uh, you're brilliant and uh, uh, polyglot as well as polymath there you go um, <laughs> you can look that one up but anyway, I know that one <laughs> yeah, good good um, and thank you for bringing in poo and lowering the stat that lowering the, the level as well uh, that's fine um, so thank you very much Amir Khan you're an inspiration and uh, we'll look forward to working with you we're hopeful about these uh, social prescribing pilots we, we think we're in one our, ourselves so we'll be uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that for you um just to say thank you and leave the final word to you you've been a real inspiration today oh, thank Annie. you I, thank you i'm honestly so honored to be an ambassador for the wildlife trust i can't believe i ever got asked in the first place so i'm genuinely genuinely chuffed every time you ask me to do anything uh so so i i I, I want to say thank you to you rather as my final thought just for having me and, and letting me be part of this uh, massive family, which I've, I've just, everybody's just been so supportive. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, Amir. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Cheers. Take and care. Get everyone. outside. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. I, uh, <laughs> bye, -bye. Wow. That was uh, quite something. Um, my final uh, act is just to say thank you all very much indeed for putting up with my chairing bit of this. Uh, I, I'm going to hand over to Rachel Bice, who's going to um, thank uh, everybody and close the meeting. But particularly thanks to Lauren and, and, and Alice, who've been looking after the technical platform today with many others. But uh, they've been great in setting up this, uh, this uh, allowing 190 people to interact with us this morning. And thank you to everybody who's contributed. Uh, Rachel Bice, over to you, our Chief Executive. Find my cursor to unmute. Thank you, Mike. Um, gosh, what an uh, uh, interesting morning. I think the case for nature has been really well made, hasn't it? And um, I hope that our work enables many of you to get your dose of nature with us and through us. And there has been some lovely suggestions in the questions that we didn't get to, for example, around making... Um, web streaming nature cameras available to people uh, we have got some plans from that it's technical sometimes but it's certainly in train and there are some other lovely ones i have also heard of people um going abroad um so maybe some of that wonderful nature in new zealand could be web web streamed into your homes as well as that in in yorkshire so so some nice ideas around things like like that also around some of the questions around how do we rethink some of our urban spaces to make it more friendly for wildlife again um, and I think that's really important actually because making those spaces softer if that's what bringing in nature does really for both the people and the wildlife I think could have a tremendous benefit for for all of us including improving those that air quality um, factor that Amir was talking about including making surfaces more permeable to make them less susceptible for flooding etc cetera, etc cetera. and all of that has wildlife and biodiversity benefits so much still for us to do I think that's that is certainly the, the case that our the knowledge and expertise of the wildlife trust staff team the army of volunteers that help us do our work all of your support in terms of um, members and supporters and, and occasional visitors even to you know the the 
the visitor centres make a massive difference about to the job that we can do for wildlife um, with you and on your behalf. So to bring today to a close, I would like to um, thank certainly Dr. Amir for joining us on his Saturday morning, really generous of him to share his time and tremendous enthusiasm. I love seeing his videos and things on, on Twitter that he's um, sharing little vignettes of his life um, and how he brings wildlife and his cultural history um, context in as well, the, the variety and diversity of that. Um, to our other contributors this morning, so um, to Pete Batchelor, thank you very much for, for preparing all the accounts, that's really appreciated, and, and to Martin, our treasurer in the background, he's been working with Pete closely, that's appreciated. Um, Richard, our honorary secretary, who has um, enabled many of the things that you know that those governance pieces about how we're um, making sure that that's working through in terms of the trustees etc all appreciated to joe and mike so joe for doing the q a that's appreciated and mike's chairmanship for for um this meeting and for for leading helping us lead the trust it's really important and the it's really important for us to say that the trustees are all volunteers and they actually give a huge amount of time to the trust and we can't do it without them it's really important that we have um the right assurance in place to make sure we we're doing the right things um, with the funds that you very generously give us as members. So I'm um, really appreciative of both the receipt of those funds and the support, as well as the people who are involved in helping us steward that as well as we can. And your feedback on that is always really very welcome um, and helpful to us. So it's really important that we're doing what you are expecting us to be doing um, and that we're sharing some of our um, why we're making decisions about things with you as well. So I was pleased to see some people requesting some of the, the reports, what have we been doing, that type of thing. Very happy to make those type of things available um, so that you know what, what we're doing. Um, the staff team that have helped make this uh, event work, um, much appreciated, uh, Lauren, Alistair, um, thank you for today for, for hosting us, Kathy in the background for taking the minutes. Um, and then there's been some the our, our design team helps make things beautiful, <laughs> um, which is much appreciated. And there were quite a few ballot papers for people to work um, to sort through in the in the post room because we did it on this way. So thank you to them as well. Um, I hope that this event has made um, get, coming along um, accessible to more people this year. And we'd really like your feedback on that. So there will be an email going out with a survey so you can let us know what worked, um, how you, if we were to do things like this in future, how it could work better for you. So please do um, let us know how it has been for you. Um, we have to um, announce the uh, proposed date of the next year's AGM at this one. So our proposal right now is the 16th of October, Saturday, the 16th of October, 2021. Um, and I say proposal because we had great plans for this year to have you all with us <laughs> in one room slightly earlier in the in the year than we with than we are today. So um, I very much hope that we will see you on the 16th of October next year. But if it isn't that date, it will certainly be another one. But um, yeah, let's get that penciled in your diaries and we'll keep our fingers crossed. And we really hope that we'll be able to see you in person next year again. So I, it, I think generally, I, I hope I've mentioned any, everybody in terms of thanks um, and really appreciated the work. Thank you for interacting with us. Um, these, it, it's, it is funny. I think someone mentioned that we're, we're talking to ourselves in a small room <laughs> and it is a little bit like that. So actually seeing the questions come up, seeing the comments are really, really valuable to us. Um, and, and I hope that you've uh, found the, the morning interesting. Um, so we will um, draw the meeting to a close. I'll say thank you. Thank you to, to Mike, who's just sat over. That's why I'm looking <laughs> sat over near to me. Thank you, Mike, um, for, for being here with this morning and stewarding us through the, the proper business, but also some of the, the fun and the interest that um, actually being part of the Wildlife Trust family um, offers to all of us. So thank you again for attending. We really can't do what we do without you. So it means an awful lot to us, but for you joining us here this morning and um, we'll close close the meeting we'll stop the recording say thank you and um, look forward to seeing you in 2021 hopefully on our reserves and certainly at the AGM next year thank you very much everyone <laughs>